Tomorrow, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, will be laid to rest in a ceremonial royal funeral at St George's Chapel in Windsor Castle. So, ahead of the ceremony, we are joined by the, in the studio today by our royal editor, Camilla Tomlin. Good morning, Good Camilla. Morning. It's great to have Good you morning. with us. We'll be talking to her in just a moment, but first, Alice Spear is live in Windsor for us. Good morning, Alice. Picking up the mood there. What, I mean, how's it feeling there? Hi, well, it's very strange to be in Windsor on a sombre occasion because, as you can see, the castle is looking magnificent. But normally when we're here and I'm standing on the street, I'm surrounded by people waving flags and cheering and it's a moment of great happiness with the shops all covered in bunting. It's a royal wedding and it's a joyous occasion. And the town is, you know, it's functioning as normal. The shops are open, as you can see. The wardens are here guarding the castle. Um, the press are very much here. Um, but the town, if you come and look around here, the town is functioning as normal. The public have been asked to stay away. There are purple vested stewards guiding people around the town, making sure that if members of the public do turn up, they abide by COVID restrictions. You can see there are a couple of the loyal royal supporters who uh, turn up at, at every occasion. They couldn't quite stay away. And yet some members of the public have come. There's a, a couple here who um, I spotted laying some flowers earlier. Hello, hello. Hi. I know you were asked uh, not to come, but you felt compelled to turn up with flowers. Mm. Tell me why. We're just great admirers of all the royal family. And uh, at a time like this, we just wanted to pay our respects and show a bit of love and support. And um, yeah, and you were allowed to lay flowers, were you? Yes, yes, we were allowed to lay flowers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, they take them in. I understand of a night, but um, you know, they must gather us such a lot. But yeah, we was free to lay flowers. Oh, good. Well, thank you very much, and th thanks for coming. Um, so yeah, don't turn up. Don't don't come. Uh, you will have a chance to have your your minute silence tomorrow. People will be remembering the Duke of Edinburgh because. As an amazing man, he will resonate with people for many, many ways, you know, whether it's as a serving officer or a grandfather or great-grandfather or, a, you know, a loyal husband. I have my own personal memories of the Duke of Edinburgh. I was very lucky to meet him on many, many occasions um, through uh, the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme. I, I, I wear my badge with Aww. pride because I did badge? my uh, award. It is a gold bad alley, badge, <laughs> Ali. You know, I did my gold award some 35 years ago and I'm still banging on about it Aww. because for me it was life-changing and for young people some two and a half million young people in this country alone and more and more across the world have done their Duke of Edinburgh award and it is a life-changing experience not because you get to go on amazing expeditions and journeys of of discovery you go through a journey of self-discovery and what Prince Philip wanted what the Duke of Edinburgh wanted when he conceived the awards in the 50s was to build a scheme whereby young people questioned the world and it, it sort of gave them the tools they needed to cope with anything that life would throw at them. And uh, in fact, this week they've launched a legacy in his name for the award so that people can donate and build a fund so that more young people can take part in what I think is going to be his biggest legacy in his name. So um, it is life changing and I think uh, befitting of an amazing man. And you've actually met him a couple of times, haven't you, Alice? Oh, yeah, on many occasions. And um, through the Duke of Edinburgh Award Scheme, you know, publicising the award, helping present awards at, at the various palaces. And the minute he walked into a room, there was a sort of... There was a spark because he was cheeky, he was feisty, he was... Um, yeah, often sort of irreverent of the, of the situation, which people loved. And any time you look at a photo of, with him uh, talking to people, engaging with people, everyone around is laughing um, because that's what he did. He lit up a room with his passion, his vibrancy and his energy. Um, and I was very honoured to have experienced that firsthand. Oh, thank you, thank Alice. Thank you, Alice. I'm about to be run that's over lovely. by a coach. Yeah. So I'm just going to move over. Get out of there. Yeah, get out of the way, Alice. <laughs> yeah, just a word on the Duke of Edinburgh Awards scheme. So set up in 56 uh, uh, to help a programme of activities for young people aged 14 to 25 designed to develop new skills, uh, run by 140 countries and now more than 8 million participants since it started. Camilla, 
it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, we'll get to the details of the funeral in just a second, but it's interesting that when... And it's, this is a sad thing when people pass, is suddenly we find out all these different things about him. You have yeah. this guy who, in one hand, was the rock and was all about the continuity of the royal family. And another is actually quite a counterintuitive man who wants to modernise the royal yeah. family and is quite spiritual in his outlook and you know, has these passions about the environment and so forth. And always is the kind of the naughty man in the room as well, always wants to be the kind of the guy who's having fun. Yeah, and could be a bit contrary and equally challenge opinions. I think throughout his life, because he had to support the Queen so stalwartly, there's this sense of him perhaps having made un PC remarks in the past. However, that was also his role almost as her warm-up act. You have this situation, I observe it often, when people are waiting to meet members of the royal family and yeah. obviously the Queen at the top of that tree. They're like rabbits in headlights. They don't know what to say. They're very, very nervous. And he would obviously come in and crack jokes and say to people, I remember one guy when I was covering them in Malta, this guy was waiting to meet the Queen and he went up to me and went, don't you think you could have shaved before meeting the Queen? And this guy had a full beard and he was like, uh, uh. he goes, oh, I'm only joking, you know, it's fine. In oh. fact, the Queen didn't like beards, but that's another matter. <laughs> Asked Prince Philip to shave his when he left the Royal Navy. Um, but the point is, I think, what we've seen over the course of the last week or so is not just this outpouring of support for, for him, really, and what he achieved in his extraordinary life, a century of service, but equally it's for the Queen. It's yeah. this idea that we feel that we must stand squarely behind her because she's devoted her whole life to public duty and she's now in this very vulnerable moment as she mm. approaches her own 95th birthday of being without her husband of 73 years. Mm. And because we see them as such a partnership, it just breaks your heart, doesn't it, to just yeah. think of her now cutting a solo figure. And I think that's difficult for people, also, to be honest. Also, the commonality that, that people, have, we, you know, we, we, I personally think we put these guys on too far, too high a pedestal, right? And actually, they're far more like us than we actually think. Yeah. And, you know, how he's been, we all have one relative that's a bit like that. Of course, that, we you know do. What I mean? Yeah. And and sadly, since his past, it's only kind of come out that that you know he is he is the man that he was. But that grandfather of the nation aspect, I think it's generational, and of course he was a man of his time. But you know, we lose him, and then we lose a connection, don't we, with our own relatives and yeah. that, that, that wartime generation. You know, it reminds me of my own grandfather who passed away years ago but was in the Royal Navy and used to wear his naval tie every day of his life after the war was over. And it's that kind of connection, I think, we have with a bygone era that the Queen and Philip represent. And because they've been this constant figure in all our lives, who can really remember even much, much older people won't remember a time when either Princess Elizabeth or the Queen was a figure of public life. Yeah. And so when that changes, I think it's quite destabilising. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it really is. Well, we do now know who's on the list yes. for the funeral. Yes, really difficult decisions being gone made down here. from 800 people to, like, 30. To 30. That, how would they have done that? Uh, well, the Palace said yesterday when we were briefed on all this that it was extremely difficult for the Queen to make these choices. What's interesting is the inclusion of three of the Duke's own German relatives. These are people whose ancestors were, were, were banned effectively from attending their wedding in 1947 because it was after the war and associations with the Germans were frowned upon. So um, these three relatives have been self-isolating in Ascot and are going to make the um, funeral. Um, they're taking the place of some key people in the Queen's life. So, for instance, she's having her own first cousins there, the Duke of Gloucester and the Duke of Kent, but not their wives. She's got all of the grandchildren there and their partners. No grand great-grandchildren expected, yeah. obviously, because the likes of Prince George, etc., are too young also for numbers. Boris Johnson said, I won't come because you have to have the family here, which is obviously good. An interesting inclusion as well as the uh, Countess Mountbatten of Burma. She's also known as Penny Romsey or Lady Braeborn. She is basically the Duke's best friend, known him for years, um, spent a lot of time with him, used to love carriage driving together, mm. so she's also made it onto the guest list. But yes, it's limited, and I think there were quite a few headaches behind Palace Gates this week sorting that out, also sorting out this issue of the Duke of Cambridge and the Duke of Sussex. Yeah, yeah I mean, it feels like... I feel like we, we're almost like perpetuating it by talking about it, but we've got to talk about it, so... I know, we can't not talk about it. And when you talk about earlier, you know, the idea of us relating to the royals, it's because we can all understand these family dramas that we can empathise and sympathise with the situation. Yeah. There's no point denying that there aren't tensions between these two. You know, the Oprah Winfrey interview only happened last month and it's left quite a lot of... Yeah. Acrimony in, within the family, which they're having to try and bury and get over for this event tomorrow. Um, 
I think it's very true to say that both sides are insisting that the focus is on remembering the Duke and supporting the Queen, and that's right. And they're on the same page. I understand they have spoken on the telephone this week. They're grateful to be on the same time zone. Anyone with relatives in other countries knows it can be really difficult to get in touch and speak properly. Um, they probably won't see each other now until tomorrow morning at the earliest because Harry's been quarantining um, in Frogmore Cottage, his former Windsor home, and he can't actually get out... He can go to the funeral because it's an exceptional circumstance, but he can't leave for any other event unless he's had a PCR test come back negative, and that won't happen until later. Um, this idea, though, that they're not going to be standing shoulder to shoulder did take us by surprise yesterday. Ordinarily, at major royal events, you just expect those two brothers to be yeah, next to each other. This is the images that we always see, um, them together. And so they're going to be flanking Peter Phillips. So Peter Phillips is Princess Anne's eldest child. It's the Queen's eldest grandson. He's going to be in between them both. Even when they walk into the chapel, they won't be next to each other. Why is they... that? Well, they've choreographed it so that um, the Duke of Cambridge walks into the chapel with Peter Phillips and then... Um, Prince Harry walks into the chapel with um, the Earl of Snowdon, who is Princess Margaret's son, um, the Queen's nephew. They're not going to sit together either because of COVID rules. Anyone that doesn't live together obviously has to be seated two metres apart. Sure. This is the heartbreaking bit. That, of course, means that the Queen is going to be on her own. Oh. And she could have had somebody from the support bubble that she's been in at Windsor, so they call it HMS Bubble. It's her and the Duke and 22 members of staff. But obviously, because it's a family occasion, she'll arrive in a state Bentley with her lady-in-waiting, but then once she's in the chapel, she will cut quite an isolated figure because none of the royals are in a support bubble with her. Mm. I think just that image is going to be so yeah, heartbreaking. It really is. Mm. And she's also going to be able to say her farewells. There's going to be a pause a really where she can say goodbye. And a poignant moment. There's, it, there's some lovely touches in this funeral. As you would expect, there's a heavy military presence. He meticulously planned it, down to the detail with the <laughs> Land Rover hearse, which is brilliant. There was a facility with that yesterday. He spent 16 years helping to design <laughs> this. This is like, almost like Egyptian I in its, it. you know, it's It's just so good. And he, pharaoh like That it? the colour should represent the colour of the Land Rovers that are used in the military. Yeah. And you're going to see all of the pomp and ceremony that you would expect with a royal event, but some lovely little nautical touches. Oh. Oh, as a great. nod to his naval career. So, like, a piping party are going to pipe these boatswain calls that you would have when you get onto a ship and when you get the crew together. There's even going to be a call by the buglers, I think, of the Royal Marines, of action stations, <laughs> which is obviously that call when, you know, all hands on deck, which I think is significant because... This is a man who spent his whole life sort of meticulously preparing to do his duty on a daily basis. And so this action station's call is basically, all right, all hands on deck, and now we lay him to rest. And after nearly 100 years of serving Queen and Country, that's it, and, and we remember him fondly. So yeah. there's going to be some really poignant moments. Unfortunately, no hymn singing because of the COVID restrictions. There's going to be a choir of four who are going to lead the nation in the national anthem beginning and end and also that very poignant moment at 3 p.m at the start where we'll have an, an, a national minute silence i don't think just for the duke actually i think as for we've everyone. all had this year yeah. and people have really lost relatives point, yeah. we can all remember can't we yeah yeah thanks, thanks camilla, camilla.